CKGSB, China's only not-for-profit independent business school. I came to the view that, that the efforts of the State Asset Administration and Supervision Commission had not really worked out very well because the return on assets of these firms has declined very dramatically uh, since the time that the SASIC was formed back in 2003. And these firms on average now earn only about half their cost of capital. Uh, they don't even earn 4% return on assets and the cost of capital is, you know, in the neighborhood of 7, 7.5%. So I think these firms have become a big drag on China's economic growth. And I think this is recognized uh, at the top of China's political system because one of the platforms or one of the components of the third plenum reforms was to eliminate monopolies except for natural monopolies. And many of the SASIC firms do operate in highly monopolized uh, sectors. Upstream oil and gas uh, is monopolized. Certainly, uh, telecommunications would be the best example. All those telecommunications companies are under the aegis of, uh, of SASIC. And some of them do better than others. But on average, the returns of these firms, as I mentioned, is very low. So you know, reducing the monopolies in these areas, increasing competition, allowing more access by private players, uh, I think is seen by the current leadership as a way of maintaining and sustaining China's economic growth. And I think, quite frankly, they're right. The evidence certainly suggests that uh, if you want to keep growing rapidly, uh, you need to reallocate capital in favor of more efficient firms, because there's a huge range of efficiency, and the state firms tend to be at the lower end. If you look back over the last decade, um, this, what some people call the hybrid form of ownership, has not really been a game changer in China. Yes, some big state firms were corporatized. A, a number of them got listed on uh, the Shanghai market or maybe some external market like Hong Kong. But the state retained a, a dominant uh, ownership of those companies. And in many cases, it's 60, 70 percent or even more. And there wasn't really much change in the governance. I think hybrid ownership is a step in the right direction, potentially. But if the state is going to remain the dominant uh, owner, it's, it's not as transformative as it might be. So I'm hoping in this time that the, the share of ownership that transfers into higher private hands will be uh, somewhat higher. And there's an opportunity to really uh, transform the operation of these companies and not just simply let uh, private people buy in to 20 or 30 percent of the shares. Uh, so that will, then that will require some fundamental changes. It will require the organization department of the party to, uh, at the national central level as well as at the local level, to step back from uh, determining the, you know, the composition of the top uh, management of these firms. I certainly think there'll be some resistance in some quarters. On the other hand, some of, uh, some of the entrepreneurial people, even in state companies, may welcome the opportunity to operate in a more competitive environment and uh, demonstrate that they can improve the efficiency of the firms that they're, uh, that they're operating. Uh, so s as some of the heavy hand of the state is lifted, I'm not against state ownership. I think what we need is competition. And if state firms can compete with private firms, they should continue to have a large role. On the other hand, if they're not able to compete uh, over time, then they probably need to shrink and uh, perhaps some of them be taken over by more uh, efficient private players. So the key way of getting more efficient uh, allocation of resources is to have more competition. If you look carefully at what the authorities have said, particularly in the People's Bank, they do have a good idea about the sequencing of these reforms. They're moving ahead gradually on all fronts, but I think they understand that it's very risky to go to very liberal uh, capital account, particularly for portfolio capital, if domestic interest rates are still highly controlled. So I think they want to move ahead uh, with several reforms simultaneously, but I do think they uh, want to have a much more market-oriented interest rate structure before they completely liberalize uh, inbound and outbound 
portfolio capital flows. I still think interest rate liberalization, and particularly the liberalization of deposit rates, would be very important because China is been, has been for a number of years in a very capital intensive growth process. And because the central bank has held down deposit rates, banks have had a cheap source of funding. And borrowers have shared in that cheap source of funding because there's enough competition in the banking sector. And one of the reasons the investment rate is so high is that the cost of borrowing money from the banking system is too low. So liberalization of deposit rates, if we look at what unregulated rates are, like money market funds or wealth management products, they tend to be 200 or 250 basis points higher than bank deposit rates. So I think if the, the ceiling on bank deposit rates were gradually phased out, that banks would have to pay more for their money, for their funds. And if they pay more on their liabilities, they're going to seek to earn more on their assets. So they will try to charge higher interest rates on their loans. This will be very positive for China's development for two reasons. It'll lead to less capital formation, less capital intensive growth. And I think it will also lead to an increase in the share of lending that is going to go to the private sector. Because the private sector is better able to pay higher rates because they are more productive and have higher returns. And since the private sector has a return on assets in manufacturing that's three times that of state companies and in services at least twice that of state companies, uh, the money will flow to firms that can generate uh, better returns. And so this will help to sustain economic growth in China even if the share of resources going into investment comes down. So you can bring down, moderate the growth of investment and still keep the overall economy growing reasonably well if the allocation of the bank loans is more efficient. Mm -hmm.